this first recording for chapter 20, the cardiovascular system, blood vessels, we'll take a look at the function of blood vessels, the structure of capillaries, the structures of veins and arteries. These first PowerPoints will describe the function of the circulatory system and the blood vessels that carry out these functions. The functions of the circulatory system include to carry blood throughout the body in order to exchange nutrients, waste products, and gases with tissues, transport substances such as uh, gases, hormones, enzymes help regulate blood pressure and direct blood flows to tissue. This is an overview of the circulatory system. Notice that the heart, the pump that keeps circulation going, accepts the oxygenated blood from veins. Large veins are called capacitance vessels and because of their size and the amount of blood they can carry, they're considered a storage of blood. Veins, large veins, are formed by the union of small veins, which are also called capacitance vessels. Capacitance vessels are those that can withstand or accommodate large volumes of blood by expanding. <clears throat> they are also considered a storage of blood because of their size. Small veins are created by the union of smaller vessels called venules. Venules come from capillaries. Capillaries are considered exchange vessels. These are tiny blood vessels, so small that red blood cells travel single file through capillaries. This is where the exchange between blood and tissues takes place. Oxygen will be delivered to the tissues As oxygen is delivered to tissues, carbon dioxide and other waste products are picked up from the tissues to the capillary. This blood that is now deoxygenated and rich in waste will circulate towards the heart through this already mentioned network of veins. So notice that veins are the blood vessels that return blood to the heart. On the left side of the heart, on the other hand, a series of blood vessels that carry oxygenated blood that has returned from the lungs will be pumped out from the aorta into the arterial system. These first large arteries are called elastic or conducting vessels, and that's where blood pressure is measured. They give rise to smaller arteries called muscular arteries, which are considered distributing vessels. Muscular arteries can constrict and dilate to adjust blood pressure. Notice that elastic arteries can withstand blood pressure, but they do not constrict or dilate. Muscular arteries become smaller. These smaller vessels are called arterioles. Arterioles are considered resistant vessels because they are small enough to provide resistance to the blood flow. They can also constrict and dilate to adjust blood pressure, just as muscular arteries can. Arterioles lead to capillaries, where again, the exchange occurs between blood and tissue. So we're looking at this continuous passage from heart to blood vessels, to tissue back to blood vessels and to the heart. 
So remember that arteries are the blood vessels that take blood away from the heart Well, veins are the blood vessels that take blood to the heart. There are three types of arteries, elastic, muscular, and arterioles. While veins are divided into venules, small veins, medium veins, and large veins. Capillaries were called the exchange vessels because that's where the exchange of gases and nutrients takes place between blood and tissue. So at this point you should be able to list the functions of the cardiovascular system and in a depiction of a circulatory system notice that typically veins are colored blue and arteries are colored red while capillaries are colored purple. So let's go back to the picture we were looking at and notice that veins are color blue, arteries are color red. This is a typical depiction to denote that most of the blood carried in most veins is deoxygenated, while most of the blood carried in most arteries is oxygenated. So the bright red blood represents oxygenated blood, the blue represents deoxygenated blood. Notice that because in capillaries, blood goes through the process of losing oxygen and acquiring CO2, capillaries are typically colored purple to demonstrate to, uh, the note that fact. <clears throat> now, notice that I said most veins will carry the oxygenated blood and most arteries will carry oxygenated blood. That means that there are exceptions. And as you study these veins and arteries, especially for lab, you should note the exceptions. You should know which blood vessels are the exchange vessels and which blood vessels are the capacitant vessels, which vessels are the resistance vessels. Resistant vessels are particularly important because they will be the ones that will help adjust blood pressure by constricting or dilating. So always note that muscular arteries and arterioles are resistance vessels. We will now denote the um, description, the structure and location of different types of capillaries and the function and structure of what we call capillary beds. There are different types of capillaries based on their location and their function. Now remember that the function of capillaries is to exchange gases, waste, and nutrients between tissue and blood. Continuous capillaries are the least permeable and the most common. So when you think of capillaries, think of continuous capillaries, since these are the most common ones. They are found in the skin and muscle. They contain no gaps between the endothelial cells that make up the capillary, um, which means that these are very uh, non-permeable uh, uh, structures. They are going to be permeable to small molecules, like water, glucose, amino acids, vitamins, and of course, gases. <clears throat> so these capillaries Remember from lab material that capillaries are, are made of single cell, um, simple squamous epithelial tissue. There are no extra structures. This is just a single, uh, a one layer of flat cells, vessels. So they're very, very thin. Continuous capillaries, again, allows for the exchange of gases, water, and nutrients like glucose, amino acids, and vitamins. But that's about it. They will not allow for the exchange of large proteins or entire cells. <clears throat> the next type of capillaries are called fenestrated. Fenestrated means windows. So these capillaries do have large windows, fenestra, pores, 
which increase their permeability, um, allowing them to exchange larger molecules such as proteins and polypeptides. These, cap these kind of capillaries are found in the kidneys, small intestines, pancreas, and endocrine glands. Remember some of the hormones secreted by endocrine glands into the blood are proteins. So these types of glands will require capillaries with larger pores than those found in continuous capillaries to be able to secrete their hormones into the blood. A small intestines will um, absorb into capillaries. The capillaries of the small intestines are absorbing broken down molecules and nutrients, which again will require pores that allow for the passage of these substances. The most permeable type of capillaries are called sinusoidal capillaries. Sinusoidal capillaries will allow for the passage of large molecules and even entire cells. They're found in special locations, such as liver, bone marrow, spleen, and some of the endocrine glands, which are secreting large hormones. <clears throat> capillaries are organized into what are called capillary beds. Capillary beds are, like I mentioned before, exchange vessels. There's about 10 to 100 of these little capillaries in a capillary bed. These structures of a capillary bed consist of the arterial that leads to the capillary bed bringing the oxygenated blood. From there, the vessels will branch uh, into the capillary bed which is called the metarterial, that will be the, the uh, um, branch that comes off of the arterial into the capillary bed. And it will split into the different capillaries that will irrigate the tissue. Notice these little pinkish structures at the beginning of this capillary bed. These are sphincters that will constrict or relax to allow more or less blood into the bed, depending on what it's needed. <clears throat> Notice also that there is a bridge that allows for the movement of blood directly from the arterial side to the venous side, bypassing the capillary bed. This is called the thoroughfare channel. So if the sphincters completely close down and do not allow blood into the bed, blood can still circulate from arterial to vein via the thoroughfare channel, completely avoiding the capillary bed. Um, <clears throat> and remember, capillaries are going to be considered exchange vessels between blood and tissues. The exchange will occur in the capillary bed. So at this point, you should go back and review the three different types of capillaries, continuous, sinusoidal, and fenestrated, noting the location uh, where these are found, each of these are found, and the types of substances that can uh, go through each of these types of capillaries. <clears throat> Notice that what controls the flow of blood through the capillary bed are going to be the sphincters. And if the sphincters are closed, note what route will the uh, blood take to move from the arterial side to the venous side. Now, we have not quite talked about the, how the autonomic nervous system uh, regulates uh, capillaries. But the question does say which branch of the ANAs regulates the vast majority of capillary sphincters, the sympathetic branch or the parasympathetic branch. Now, we have not yet talked about it. However, we have mentioned, or you should have known from last semester, that the only ANS branch that innervates blood vessels is the sympathetic uh, branch of the autonomic nervous system. So let me reiterate, from Biology 2401 or 
um, from a previous lecture, you should know that the only branch of the autonomic nervous system that innervates blood vessels is the sympathetic nervous system. And we will explain further in this chapter. I do want to point out, however, that there are a few blood vessels that have dual innervation. And these are some of the blood vessels of the reproductive system. And we will touch on those when we go over the reproductive system. However, uh, for now, we could make a blanket statement, a temporarily blanket statement, and say that only the sympathetic nervous system innervates blood vessels. So now we're going to talk about the structure of blood vessels. Uh, we will talk about uh, veins and arteries and pay attention about between their um, different uh, their uh, differences and their similarities. And this is material that you will also need to learn for the lab practical. So blood vessels are considered to have three layers, what we call the tunica intima, and we're moving from the deepest layer to the most superficial layer. So the tunica intima is the deepest layer. The middle layer is called the tunica media. The outer layer is called the tunica externa or adventitia. Notice that large and small blood vessels will have modified tunics or may even have absent tunics. All blood vessels, no exception, will have endothelium lining the surface of the lumen. The endothelium is the simple squamous epithelial cells, simple squamous epithelial tissues that makes up the actual blood vessel. So the, the surface of the lumen, of the opening of the blood vessel, it's made by this endothelium, which is a simple squamous epithelial tissue. In arteries, the tunica intima will also include a layer of uh, elastic tissue called the internal elastic membrane. The tunica media is where blood vessels will be found. Notice that this is the layer that will be innervated by sympathetic nerve fibers so as to control the smooth muscle of the tunica media and control the size of the blood vessel, whether it will expand when the sympathetic innervation decreases and the muscles relax, or maybe contract when sympathetic innervation increases and the muscle contracts. In some arteries, there will also be a layer of another layer of elastic tissue called the external elastic membrane. So notice that arteries may have two layers of elastic tissue, one in the tunica intima and one in the tunica media. Notice that veins do not have this elastic tissue structure. <clears throat> the outermost layer is the tunica externa or adventitia. This is loose connective tissue that um, merges with the connective tissue of surrounding blood vessels. Also in this layer, we're gonna find the vessa vasorum, which are the blood vessels that nourishes blood vessels. So especially large blood vessels need their own blood vessels to keep their cells alive. These are the blood vessels of blood vessels called the vessa vasorum. So this picture depicts the uh, a representation of both arteries and veins and their structures. Notice that both of them have tunica intima uh, made up of endothelium, but that only arteries are going to have the internal elastic lamina. Also notice, though, on the other hand, that veins are going to have valves made of the endothelium itself. The tunica media is made of smooth muscles 
um, <clears throat> the smooth muscles, the, uh, the layer of a smooth muscle, it's typically thicker in arteries than it is in veins. And notice that in um, arteries, there will also be an external elastic lamina. The tunic externa is a layer of connective tissue, which is maybe actually thicker sometimes in veins than it is in arteries. Um, notice also the construction of capillaries. All they have is a tunica intima, an endothelium, without internal elastic lamina. So this is a very simple blood vessel. Uh, this is a good representation of a blood vessel. This is a, um, let's see, this is a, a, an artery because it has an internal and an external elastic lamina. It has a thick layer of muscle. Notice the innervation of the muscle. This is sympathetic innervation that is going to control the muscle, constricted uh, when sympathetic innervation increases, stimulus increases, or relax the muscle when sympathetic the stimulus decreases. And finally, here we have an actual picture, a cross-section of an artery and a vein, which further dramatizes the differences between them. First of all, the first thing that catches your eye is that the artery, as it has been cut, even though it has been cut, it is still retains its circular shape, whereas the vein has collapsed. Notice, however, that had the vein not collapsed, it would have a larger space inside, a larger lumen than the artery. So veins are, in general, larger than arteries. Also notice the multitude of dark wavy lines that you see in the artery. These are the elastic tissue, which you can see all over uh, in abundance in the artery. Veins, on the other hand, have very little elastic tissue, which is the reason why they collapse when they're called, cut. Uh, there's another difference, which is a little bit uh, harder to note, but notice that the endothelium of the arteries folds. You can see there how it's folded, whereas the endothelium of veins is even, is not folded. So that's another difference between them. Again, this will be especially important for lab to know the differences between arteries and veins. This is an elastic or conducting artery. This is an important artery <coughs> because um, it's the one that will be the largest of arteries. The aorta, for example, is one of the few elastic or conductic arteries. Uh, they don't constrict or dilate. So uh, sympathetic innervation is not going to constrict or dilate these large arteries. They have more elastic fibers than muscle. However, because they have so much elastic fibers, they will recoil when it's stretched and they will accommodate blood pressure. So they're going to prevent blood pressure from falling rapidly by accommodating increasing volumes of blood. This right here is a muscular artery. This one is an artery that can vasoconstrict or vasodilate in response to sympathetic stimulation, so that it will be involved in uh, regulating blood pressure. Um, it has a, a thick muscle, and it does have the two internal and external elastic laminas. <clears throat> And this is looking at arterioles, which are the smallest of arteries. And again, this can vasoconstrict and vasodilate to control blood pressure and blood uh, uh, flow to, through tissue. And this uh, PowerPoint is talking is looking at the sizes of veins. 
medium and small veins and venules. Notice that the medium veins are going to have valves made by endothelium. Uh, just like the uh, some of the small veins will. Uh, this fig figure depicts the valves that we see in um, some veins. The function of these valves is to try to prevent blood from falling or back flowing, going back uh, in the wrong direction, especially in areas that are subject to gravity, like the legs. Um, as we age, most of the changes that we find with aging will take place in the aorta. Uh, the large arteries like the aorta, carotids, and some of the smaller coronary arteries in the heart. Some of these blood vessels would harden. The, I mean, the hardening of blood vessels is called arteriosclerosis. And when a blood vessel hardens, especially an elastic blood vessel, it cannot accommodate increasing blood volume. Therefore, the blood pressure will increase. Um, if the blood vessel is elastic and when there is more blood inside, it expands, it accommodates that, that extra volume and therefore blood pressure will not increase significantly. However, if the blood vessel stiffens due to arteriosclerosis, when blood volume increases, as for example, when the ventricles pump blood out into the aorta, more blood all of a sudden is received by the aorta, which is an elastic blood vessel and is supposed to expand to accommodate the extra uh, momentary uh, blood volume. And if it cannot do that because it's hardened, now blood pressure in the aorta will increase. These changes occur typically in the tunica media, um, where the elastic tissue deteriorates and more collagen fibers and calcium deposits accumulate. Atherosclerosis is a form of arteriosclerosis in which the hardening of the arteries is due to plaques that occlude blood vessels. Plaques are typically made of lipids, calcium deposits, um, and they're found in uh, the smooth muscle of the uh, of the blood vessel. Sometimes white blood cells also accumulate and that may be due to inflammation. Um, if um, <clears throat> if a, a plaque causes a blood clot, the condition is called thrombosis. If thrombosis, if the clot um, dislodges from its location and begins to travel through the body, it, that condition is called embolism. So at this point, you should be familiar with the construction of blood vessels. Where are the endothelial cells found in which of the tunics, tunica intima, tunica media, or tunica externa? Which blood vessels which blood vessel structures are innervated by the autonomic nervous system? Remember that the only effectors that the nervous system can control are going to be muscles and glands. In this case, it is muscles that the nervous system is controlling, the smooth muscles of blood vessels. You should know what is vasivasorum. Um, why do veins, especially large veins, tend to collapse? Which vessels? Uh, which vessel is adapted to withstand greater pressure and what is the nature of the adaptation. So this is talking about the large elastic veins. Which vessels are adapted for vasoconstriction or vasodilation? And especially in arteries, those are, those are important, which will be the muscular arteries and arterioles. Uh, what is the function of valves in veins? We've discussed that. Distinguish between arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis being a form of arteriosclerosis, which involves the accumulation of a plaque inside the blood vessel.